We're told that faith can move mountains, but the evidence is slender. Hope, it's been said, deludes a foolish man, while acts of charity seem scarcer than the homes where charity begins. In looking at what can be done to help people homeless and ill-housed, an accurate description of the scale and diversity of their problems is useful. More use than the statements of Secretaries of State, who boast unfailingly of housing targets, but not of homes demolished, of communities destroyed, housing standing empty, of housing stupidly planned, absurdly juxtaposed to places of work, or of the great army of the homeless. They can be counted. On any night of the year, there are 30,000 known people without a home in Britain. That's the scale of the problem. The shelter organization sees the diversity of the problem through the eyes of its people working in the field with the homeless and the ill housed. Shelter Housing Ed Centre, can I help you? Yes, certainly, just a moment. Shelter's 15 housing aid centres offer a sympathetic hearing and sound advice. Yes, that's correct, yes. Can you tell me a little bit about the home that you're living in at the moment? How many rooms have you got? We have three rooms. Three rooms. Is that a living room and two bedrooms? Uh, no, it's a, it's a living room, a kitchen. 10,000 families a year have called on London's housing aid centre. Shack's function is to discern the problem and provide the necessary help. Um, now, when has the landlady told you to leave? Um, has she given you an exact date when she wants you out? As I'm sure you know, we in Shack don't have any accommodation. All we can do is to advise families, advise families who do have problems like yourself, and try to help them. Yes, when we last contacted us, we suggested that you get in touch with the Wandsworth Self Self-Help Housing Association. Now, did you do this? The problem situations that recur are described by Shack's director, Father Byrne. A housing aid centre is a place where anybody with a housing problem can come and receive professional help yes. with that problem. It can be that we'd be looking at the possibility of the person or the family buying a home of their own. It could be that we would want to move them from one of the great problem conurbations out to a new town. Or it could be that we'd be looking to the council or to a landlord or to the private market to, to find rent accommodation. Uh, and this, in fact, is what Shack is doing. We're seeing 10,000 families a year now, um, giving them as much help as we can. And I think we have a voice that's being heard quietly um, as part of the overall shelter voice feel for the homeless. One of shelter's best weapons in the fight against homelessness is the prevention of evictions, and one of their best preventers is Audrey Harvey. I don't stick my neck out for the difficult cases that people don't like, because um, I look on this sort of work um, chiefly as finding defences for people in rather unlikely situations. For instance, um, rent arrear cases, you'd think there's probably no defence to that, most people do, but there often is, because sometimes you find the family isn't being paid enough um, benefits, you know, state benefits, mm -hmm. and you need to check those up, and you can often stop an eviction, yeah. because you find that they haven't had the right amount. I'm very interested in stopping council evictions, because for years they, they don't seem to have been challenged enough, and you find, especially outside London, where most of the shelter groups are, um, that... Um, Often councils, little rural district councils, evict people for quite unreasonable sums, say five or six pounds, or because they don't think they're sort of socially up to the standards of the estate and things like that. But if you challenge that, although there's no defence in law, you can sometimes get it withdrawn quite often. And then, of course, there are all the tenancy law ones of trying to find defences through that, especially the one where uh, tenancy looks as though it's furnished but you can sometimes prove that in law it shouldn't be counted as furnished. And that's marvellous because then the tenant acquires security of tenure and is relatively safe. Not, nobody's absolutely safe. Audrey Harvey protects those threatened with eviction. But there is another group of young couples whose circumstances are not so dramatic on the face of it, they simply can't afford to move into a home on the salaries they earn in the profession. As the affluent society vanishes in the nightmare of inflation, the bad old days of the Depression offer a sharp reminder that the value of homes hasn't changed. 
If anything, they're probably cheaper. Only their price has risen, as the value of money has gone down. Until today, many young people in the professions, like teaching, can't afford a home. We felt that uh, with a fairly reasonable income between the two of us, and, you know, we'd like to stop um, moving around from one bed sitter to another, you know, or, or not having a bath or hot water or something of that sort, uh, and look for a place which we can buy fairly cheaply, we hoped, and, and do up and make it into a reasonable sort of place. We've got a joint gross income of uh, something like 4,400, you know, which uh, sounds quite a lot, and that means that apparently we've got a mortgage potential of about 10,000. But when you actually come to look for places, you find that um, flat conversions in the sort of less affluent areas and old houses are in those kind of areas are just about all there is in London that's under 10,000. The rising cost of building and of land has made a solid part of the local authority's responsibility for housing in our inner city. What is built often pays more obedience to remotely contrived plans and standards than to community needs of size, location or quality. Meanwhile, the housing waiting list grows faster than new housing stock, according to shelters man in Liverpool, David Marr. Uh, in London, there are 200,000 families on the waiting list. In Birmingham, it's nearly 50,000. In all the major cities, there's a very real waiting list preventing people from getting uh, for the most part, the only kind of housing that they can afford. Those who don't get local authority housing and can't afford to buy must rent from the private landlord. But privately rented accommodation in Britain has fallen in the last 20 years from a quarter of the total housing stock to less than a seventh. Statistics familiar to Enid English shelters Bristol-based regional organiser. Well, the private rented accommodation that's available and that has been available across the last few years has dropped, has dwindled very dramatically to sometimes as low as 11% of the total amount of accommodation that, 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 that is available for families. And I mean, just to take my own town, for example, uh, as many as 100 families, families queue up for an unfurnished flat that comes on the market let alone, you know, the hordes of people who queue up for the, for the furnished flats and bedsits and what have you. I mean, a single person has enough difficulty. A family has considerably more difficulty. It's the private landlord who's now uh, passing away, really, as far as the provision of housing is concerned. And he can be very particular with the present state of the market about who he houses. There is no need anymore for a private landlord to house a poor family or a sick family, a coloured family, um, a disabled. Those people, and many others, are automatically disqualified uh, from the housing market as it stands. People and families who find themselves living in the bleak structures of an earlier period like these are the real casualties of the recent boom in property and housing. Lacking the protection of a lease, a council tenancy, or a home of their own, their individual struggles to get the home they need are doomed to failure unless they win the pool. In our cities, they have nowhere to go, nowhere in the world to go that could be called a home. Families are often on the street for the whole day after being given last night's subsidized bed and this morning's breakfast. Quite what they're supposed to do until dark is anybody's guess, but not anybody's responsibility. If lucky, they may be given the luxury of temporary accommodation in converted workhouses, ex-service huts, and the tenements of a bygone age, and often left to live there on a far from temporary basis. These places go by the harmless sounding title of part three accommodation. This is the bottom of the pile. Rackmanism may be death, and predatory landlords are sometimes rebuked in our courts. But from the bottom of the pile, it all looks very much the same as it ever was. Well, it's just pure hell. Just pure hell. You can't let your children down in the square. My own little daughter was down in the square, and she was taken out of the square by somebody and indecently assaulted in a flat across the road. And we was promised, oh, you know, you was moving to a place you'd never be believed you was in the heart of London, with a tennis court and grass and French windows. Well, as you know, you can see what it is. <laughs> Dilapidated tennis court, no grass and no French windows. Edward Henry is blacklisted all over London. 
there is no shop that will supply anything to anybody on HP, and it doesn't matter what references they have. They're from work or anything like that. They said, well, if you're from Edward Henry, they don't want to know. We don't want it. We couldn't get buy a place on our own. It's impossible, you know. But we had to go into the put our, the hands ourselves in the hands of the welfare. So we had to put the wife and the two kids in the reception centre at Brixton. I had to find a place of my own. I had to go to the own house for a fortnight, and then yeah. the. the sent word to me that uh, I could go in the reception centre as well, we were away from the two kids. So I went there for a week and they gave us a two-room flat in Old Kent Road. And from there we got moved up to here on the promise that we'd be out of here within 18 months. But it's two and a half years now, so people have been here for five years, some of them five and a half years, and uh, still getting the same promises that they got when they first came. Promises, even if well meant, are a poor substitute for decent premises. But promises broken by council officers are perhaps less painful than eviction by one's own family.